hot barrels and tight lines. This is Brian Mookie, and welcome back to Conversations with a Sportsman. In this episode, come along for a journey into the Horicon Marsh with Mel Ellis. Beginning in 1957 and continuing for 15 years, Mel Ellis was the outdoor editor of the Milwaukee Journal, a keen observer of nature and eloquent advocate for wildlife and wild places, Ellis is fondly remembered as having penned some of the finest outdoor writing in the country. Pull up a chair, sit back, and enjoy a mucky duel. A cold night, an open fire, friends. A warm drink. Time to remember. Time for a hunting story. The hunt took place in autumn, 1938, at Horicon Marsh. It was only a few years after the dam was finished and closed to back up water and create the great lush oasis that eventually became a home and halfway house to hundreds of thousands of waterfowl. An early wet spring that year created a bumper duck crop on the nesting grounds to the west. Then, a drought settled in. By fall, the great duck factories of the Dakotas and Canadian provinces became pockmarked with crusty craters into which the ponds and lakes seemed to seep away right through cracks in the mud. Great hordes of ducks fleeing the dusty barrens, moved east, many into Wisconsin. For Wisconsin hunters and the ducks, it was a homecoming at Horicon. You see, central Wisconsin had escaped the drought. And that fall, water behind the dam backed up and out of the Horicon marsh ditches and river channels through the stands of willow trees and beyond into the pastures. So the ducks came by the tens of thousands. And I knew whereof my grandfather spoke when, I, when he talked of flocks hiding the sun. It was enough to bring my cousin Jim home from college and me back for a short vacation from newspapering. In hip boots, we waded past the weeping willows, and it was no challenge to kill a limit of ten birds. As usual, when we were together, something like an old sibling rivalry seemed to surface. We had to make the next hunt a contest, not just between the ducks and us, but between each other. Under our rules, we each took 10 shotgun shells into the marsh. We agreed to only kill drakes. If by accident we killed a hen, it would be subtracted from the score. So a bag of five drakes and one hen would count as four points. 10, of course, was the perfect score. I collected six drakes and one hen with my 10 shells for a score of five. When I came out, Jim was still among the willow trees. So I went to the sheltered nook next to a rock pile where we had agreed to meet. The sun felt good and I fell asleep. When I awakened, it was dark. I sat a moment listening 
Then I called out in regular intervals. Finally, I walked up the slope, down the lane, to the farm where we had parked the car. The car was still there, and the farmer hadn't seen Jim. So the two of us went back to the marsh. We built a fire and we waited. After a couple hours, the farmer suggested we call the sheriff. He may have fallen into a peat burn, the farmer said, voicing a concern I, I felt from the very beginning. You see, in dry years, the rich peat soil of the marsh had caught fire, burning and smoldering for months, even through winter. The fire slowly ate deeper into the bog. Then later in spring, when rain came, and in wet seasons, these burns filled with water, creating numerous potholes scattered throughout the marsh. Many an unfortunate hunter had stepped into a peat burn, not to find firm footing, but instead a feeling of being swallowed into a seemingly bottomless pit. Some of these burns were more than 10 feet deep and 30 feet across. Cattle had even perished in them. In the dark, it'd be difficult to avoid them. Soon, the sheriff and three deputies arrived. We shot our guns and blew the sirens as signals. An hour went by and, and nothing. I thought echoes might distort sound direction, and I suggested we tie oil-soaked rags to a windmill on the farm and light them to put out a beacon. Well, we were about to start back for volunteers uh, to begin a search when the farmer said, listen. It was a voice. Above the clamor of ducks, well, we shouted and, and shot our guns. And, and then Jim emerged from the trees. In the beams of flashlights, he looked like a snapping turtle, right up from the mud after a long winter hibernation. He had lost his hat, his boots bulged with water, and his face was plastered with mud. We helped him to the rock pile and gave him a drink from the, the bottle provided by the sheriff. I lit a cigarette and gave it to him. Another drink and he was talking. He had lost his way and had gotten stuck on the edge of a water-filled peat burn. We waited to hear the rest of the story. But instead of continuing, he turned to me and asked, How many drinks? What's your score? Well, I told him I'd scored five. Well, he grinned, nudged his bulging hunting coat. Well, I pulled the flap and I shook it. Out rolled nine drinks. Well, all I could manage to say was, <laughs> It isn't 10. He smiled through the mud, reached into his pocket, pulled out a shell. Holding it up, he said, I've got one more shot coming. <laughs> Tomorrow. 